Um, uh, so I, I love the idea about, about competition. And I think the idea about, uh, you know, a, a, a consumer education uh, is, is really important. I mean, so I'll put a plug. We have a PFM course that I run with people in this room, and one of the goals is really to kind of empower people to say, if you're on either side of the table, how do you do a good job providing your product, and how do you do, do a good job working out what you want? And I think that that's what we want. The last thing that I want is known as coordinating around a, an even more rigid PIFA or an even more rigid set of the Germans will do internal audit, the French will do external audit, the British will do budget, because that's what coordination tends to end up looking like, and it's, it's a nasty beast. And it takes the menu away, it takes the options away, and it fixes an agenda, and it is not a good idea. So I, I think that we should be saying, how do we m m make <coughs> uh, agencies compete, and how do we empower uh, governments to be really good consumers? Uh, which would also be an interesting thing because I wonder how many of the people in the field actually could represent their country systems. How many of the people in the field are hawking products that they could actually explain well and actually sell properly? Uh, I don't think that you know the standard of people working in this area is as good as it should be and as good as it could be. And I think that everyone would benefit because I think we'd get better people who have to do a better job and we get people who make better decisions. I think that's the first thing. On the metrics, I agree with you. I think this is a really hard thing to do, Andrew. Um, you know, measuring functionality. Uh, part of it is, is not the outcomes, right? Part of it is the behavioral change element that Nick was speaking about. And, you know, so I, I, don't, I don't pretend to, <coughs> to, to be there. I do think, though, that if we can't name it, so if we can't give it a name and if we can't give it some kind of metric or at least un un understand where we're going to, we're not going to get out of the form approach. That's kind of my, my, my real focus here is we need to be able to do that. And I think we can do it in some areas. It's never going to be perfect, and we're always going to be kind of on this continuum somewhere. But I think we can do a better job. Um, in terms of, uh, Nick, the, the, um, uh, I think the, the comment from Nick and then Simon was kind of two sides, right? How do you sell PDIA to the donors, to the civil engineers, and then how do you sell it to the governments? Um, the first thing is I, I don't want to be selling PDIA to anybody. Because PDI is a set of principles on how to do something different. I do not have a consulting firm that sells PDI. I don't know how to do PDI. <laughs> the weird thing is I actually, I actually Googled the other day and I found that people are offering PDI courses in <laughs> different parts of the world. And I would love to go and see what they teach. Um, <laughs> that said, that said, here's, I, I think that the principles need to be sold. Uh, and we need to work out how to do that. And, and here's how I would think about doing it in, in the donor organizations, Nick. You said it's a civil engineering model. It is a civil engineering model. When civil engineers decide what they want to do, however, they are very clear about the assumptions they're making about what they're doing. And they build in a mechanism so that they can test those assumptions on the go and so that they can learn to make adjustments. And in every single civil engineering project, and I'm not a civil engineer, but I have friends who are, there is space to adjust and to change based on what you learn on the go. Now, this is one of the things that is almost completely missing in the development sphere. And so, you know, my sense would be to say to people, how do we maybe work with the projects that you have and the project systems and the mechanisms that you have, but make some adjustments like that and say, let's make clear up front what are the assumptions we're making about the political space? What are the assumptions we're making about capacity? What are the assumptions we're making? And then let's ensure that within three months and six months and nine months, we have mechanisms so that we can test whether our assumptions work. Now, this is something that I think would go down fairly well in most donor organizations because I think people are really smart and they kind of get it. The other thing I would say is that there are many instruments in most donor organizations, bilateral and multilateral, that do give the kind of flexibility that we're looking for. And in the cases that I look for, people use them. Okay? I don't know if they exist anymore, but the learning and, and, uh, learning and innovation loan was, a, was directly about this. It was directly about this. The problem was people didn't use it. Now, I think you're talking a little bit about the culture of the organizations and the incentives people have and how hard it is to get something through the board, but the mechanisms and the instruments exist, and we need to work out how to make those instruments and those mechanisms more useful for people. On the government side, I would also say, I don't think we should be saying what you need to do is PDIA. I agree with you. It's, it, it's, I mean, what is PDIA? 
What you need to be doing is saying to people, do you really want to solve your problems? Do you understand what those problems are? And integrate into your processes, not a, well, let's just kind of try something and see where it goes, but a structured way of saying, let's have a conversation about your projects. And I think the conversation that Marco was saying, you know, in PDA, we don't just say start with problems, right? The interesting observation, remember I said was that it wasn't, the, the, the change didn't happen uh, at the point of the crisis. It happened after. So there was this process of work. And I think what you had in that process of work was identifying why the problem mattered, why it occurred, and what options you had to solve it. Now, you're not talking about an unstructured process. It's very structured. And now you're going to the minister and you're saying, if you have a real problem, instead of just assuming or pretending that the thing that you're being told to do is going to solve it, why don't we just spend a little bit more time thinking a little bit more seriously about it before we commit to the one solution? I think it's very different from making it up as you go along. It's, a, it's not the same thing. Um, the other thing that I would say to Simon is you could go to the minister and say, by the way, in, in management theory and in the private sector, people are doing it this way more and more and more. So if you want to go look at how software is developed, people are moving away from the approach of kind of design it all and put it in. Agile theory is an approach that has emerged very like PDIA for exactly the same reason that we need it, is that many systems we had been developed that people then weren't using. So they said, well, how do we develop in a more interactive way so that it becomes a useful product? But I don't think you want to sell PDIA. You want to sell the vision and the promise of problem solved and of useful functionality at the fingertips of the minister. Thanks very much, Matt.